Father, we bless you today. Thank you for your goodness to us. Paying the debt that we owed that could never be paid except by the blood of your son, Jesus. So we cry with your saints all over the world today. You are worthy. You are worthy. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. I just want to say, listen, can you hear me fine? Am I on? No? Let me wait just a second. Let's see if we're done. Check one, two. I should be on here. Have it? Check one, two. Oh, you got it? Can you hear me? There we go. Great. Awesome. So I've got a little bit of echo up here, Shiloh. I'll let you work on that. So, Well, good morning. I love singing with you guys. And the songs we sang this morning, man, just declaring the truth of the gospel and being able to just put that out there together like that is incredible. And that's where we're going to be going today in the message. Uh, but before we get there, I just want to say happy Father's Day to all you dads. And what a blessing and gift. Can we thank our dads? Happy Father's Day. What a blessing to have you all singing up here this morning and leading us in worship. It's just powerful when the men sing together. I just uh, am always blessed by that. And to be a part of that, to be counted among the number of fathers at Western Hills is such a privilege to me. Uh, you guys have taught me how to be a dad by watching your example, watching you lead your children. And I am so grateful for doing this together and being part of this team together. So thank you guys for that. Well, we are going to dismiss the children to the Bible zone right now with Mr. Stephen right out this door. So what we're going to talk about this morning is a message that's very personal to me. In fact, I would say there's no message that is more personal to me than the message that I'm preaching this week. And I'm just excited how God works things out because that's how Pastor Jerry started his message last week. And if you missed that message last week, you need to go back and hear the why about the gospel and the power that the gospel has in our life. And we're going to pick up right on that theme because in my life, the gospel is what changed everything. And as we talk about this subject of the gospel this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put two things in front of you from the very start. And I hope to help you understand a little bit more about what we mean when we say gospel. Because if you're anything like I was, when you hear the word gospel, you think about that thing that evangelists come into the church and preach. Or you think about that message that you heard when you were a kid or later on in your life and you believed on Jesus and it saved you from hell. And I want you to know that's part of the gospel. But I also want you to understand something that I never got it why some preachers would stand up in the pulpit and say, you need the power of the gospel every single day in your life. I thought, what? I went back when I was six years old. I prayed that prayer. I'm saved. I'm good. I'm going to heaven. But I, I didn't understand it because I didn't understand the whole gospel. And this morning, that's where we're going to go. I, I want to hopefully, as a church, understand the whole gospel together. So here's a couple claims as we get started. Look at the screen behind me. The gospel we believe determines the lives we live. The gospel we believe determines the lives we live. And then the gospel we preach determines the disciples we make. So they're not with me yet, but we'll get there. Let's put them up, guys. I want everyone to see it. Here we go. The gospel we believe determines the life we live. That's the first one. And then the gospel we preach determines the disciples that we will make. All right, so when it comes to the gospel and getting it right in a church and in a person's life, this is not a new problem. 
This is a problem as old as the church. You go back to the first century church and you look at what the gospel is and trying to wrestle with this and get what is the whole gospel? How do we get this right in our lives? It goes all the way back to the first century church. So uh, look at Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 12 with me. This is a passage where Paul's about to be presenting the whole gospel to the church. He went to Galatia as a missionary. He led people to believe the gospel and, he's, and he left leaders in charge of the church there, and then he withdrew from that place, and later on, he wrote that church to encourage them in the gospel. He had heard some reports about what was going on in Galatia, so he said, okay, I'm going to write you a letter, and I'm going to encourage you in the gospel. And you can read Galatians uh, 1 through 6 outlines the gospel um, in, that, in that passage of scripture, uh, but this is what Paul said to start that from the very beginning of this passage in Galatians. He said, Paul said, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Do you see the struggle? To get gospel right. You're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So there's only one true gospel Of the one true God. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we already preached to you, let him be accursed. Did you get that? He said, if an angel comes down from heaven and shares with you another gospel besides the one we already preached to him, to you, let him be accursed. And then he says, as we have said before, so I now say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached to me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was it taught but I received it through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what we're talking about this morning is the one true gospel of the one true God. We're talking about the gospel that Paul delivered to the church in Galatia that he later wrote back and said, listen, if an angel comes down from heaven and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. If anyone comes to you and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. He says, the gospel I preach to you is the gospel of God. It's the one true gospel of the one true God. I didn't leave anything out. It's the whole gospel. And once again, I want us to understand this. The gospel we believe determines the life we live. The gospel we believe determines the life we live. And the gospel we preach determines the disciples we will make. So when you think about the gospel, it's it's like a foundation. Okay, in scripture, there's a couple analogies that scripture uses. To talk about the church, Peter uses an analogy of living stones. Perhaps you remember this. And he says, you're a living stone, you're a living stone, you're a living stone, and we're all being built up together as one building the body of Christ, a place where God's spirit dwells, okay? So we are one body in Christ. So that's one analogy, is a building being built up living stones. That's the church. There's another analogy that the scripture uses. Paul uses this one in 1 Corinthians 3. He uses the analogy of a foundation. And on that, he's talking about what will last and stand the test of time. And in that, he says, only those things that are built on the the firm foundation will last the test of time. And then he says, what is that foundation? Well, that foundation is Jesus Christ. It's his message. It's his gospel. So you have this analogy in scripture of a foundation and you have this analogy in scripture of a building, these two things that go together. Now, if you know anything about construction, even rudimentary knowledge on construction, you know that the most important thing you've got to get right is the foundation. I want you to take a look at these pictures on the screen behind me of these buildings that have stood the test of time. You see, when you get the foundation right on something and then you build something solid on top of it, what you build on that foundation, if it's built together strongly, it will stand the test of time. I mean, look at some of these dates, like with the Colosseum, 70 AD, okay? Or you have the Taj Mahal, 
1632 AD. You got the Forbidden City, 1406 BC. But look at the Acropolis of Athens, 438 BC. And then look at the ancient pyramids of Egypt, 2589 BC. Now, young earth creation theories start somewhere around 6,000. So, I mean, if, if you're thinking young earth creation, you're thinking nearly stood the entire test of time, these buildings. Why? Because they're built with sturdy material, but they're built on a strong foundation. Now consider these next pictures. If you're a homeowner, the worst news you can possibly get is what? That you have a problem with your foundation. Oh man, I mean, everything else you can kind of fix and work on, but if you've got a massive problem with your foundation, I mean, you can't even insure your house if you have a problem with your foundation. I guarantee you these structures that you're seeing behind me are not since 2500 BC, right? These are just a few decades old, maybe a couple hundred years old at the most, but you can see the problems. When the foundation is crumbling, the structure on top of it crumbles right along with it. Here's another picture of maybe the most famous foundational problem in a building in the whole world is the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? The most famous structure with a bad foundation. You've maybe seen those pictures of people holding up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? They go and visit this from all over the world. This structure was built actually over a span of a few centuries, but they found out into the construction that the, the structure, it was leaning. And multiple engineers from all over the world over centuries have tried to fix the lean in this building. Millions of dollars have been invested to try to help this building survive the test of time. But experts today believe that this building is stable enough to last maybe a couple hundred more years. Now put that in perspective of the pyramids. Maybe a couple hundred more years is what this building has left in it. And that's with millions of dollars and the best minds in the world trying to get together to figure out how to keep it standing. The church is built of living stones, but the church must be built on the firm foundation, which is Jesus Christ. His message is his gospel, the one true gospel of the one true God. If it's not built on that, it won't last. So church at Western Hills, I want us to think about this this morning. Do we want to build something together that will last, that will stand the test of time, that will outlive this building, that will outlive this gathering, but will go on forever and ever and ever? The scriptures say that we can do that. But together, we must be built up as living stones on the firm foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And if we don't build on that and that alone, whatever we build with our lives, personally or collectively, will not last. But if we build it on the gospel, it will stand the test of time. So how important is the gospel? How important is it to understand it? both in our own lives, if we want what we do to stand the test of time, and as a church, if what we want that we're doing together, if we want it to stand the test of time, how important is the gospel? Well, it's the foundation. It's the foundation. Get the gospel wrong, and you get the leaning tower of Pisa, and you can throw money at it, and time at it, and minds at it, and it doesn't matter what you invest in it, it's not gonna last. But if you get the gospel, and you build it on the gospel, it will last. So are you with me this morning? The gospel we believe determines the lives we will live. The gospel we preach determines the disciples we will make. It's the foundation, the gospel. So it's very personal to me what I'm sharing with you today. And one of the reasons why it's very personal to me is I want to share with you some of my story. And this is a part of my story that I think many of you have not heard before. And I'm going to share with you some of my story this morning because the gospel changed my life. I was on a course that was like this, and what Jesus did through the gospel is he just tore that building down and built something new on a new foundation. And that's my story. It's really uh, personal to Rachel and I, both of us, um, but we want to share it with you because we love you. 
and we consider you to be our family. So Rachel and I will have been married for 15 years this December. Several years ago, I experienced a personal revival through God's grace and through learning the whole gospel. You see, when I was six years old, I believed on the gospel and I decided to follow Jesus. But 20 years passed, and it wasn't until I was 26 that I realized that I had never understood, come to faith in, and fought for faith in the whole gospel, the one true gospel of the one true God. I had embraced ideas that seemed right to me, but they were not part of the one true gospel of the one true God. Over time, Satan had told me things and had just kind of dug at the roots of the foundation in my life, put some cracks and some holes in it, and what I was building in my life was not stable because I did not understand the one true gospel of the one true God. I'm a firm believer that the gospel saved my marriage. But apart from the gospel, my marriage would not have lasted. I'm a firm believer that the gospel made me the father that I need to be to my kids. That without the gospel, I would not have been the dad that I need to be. The gospel changed me as a pastor. I was not on the right course as a pastor. The gospel put me back on that course. The gospel transformed me into an effective disciple maker and evangelist. So many times with other people that I was discipling, I had shared things that came from what I thought to be the truth, but it wasn't the truth. And when I discovered the truth, the message in my own life and the message I shared with others got power, a power that I had never been able to share with anyone else before. And the power that they had to overcome sin and, a li and live a life that's pleasing to God was just different and changed as God did that work in me and then as he did that work through me, through his spirit in other people. The gospel freed me from the hold of sin on my life. I was, I was in bondage to sin and I didn't have to be. That's part of the gospel. I had been set free in Christ, but I didn't understand the authority I had in Jesus, who I was in Jesus. I wasn't fighting for faith in that gospel, so I was struggling with sin, but when I believed the gospel, it gave me power over sin through faith and fighting for faith in the gospel. I want you to know what the gospel did for me, it will do for you too. In your emotions, in your thoughts, in your relationships, in your life, in your ministry, in your discipleship, what the gospel did for me it will do for you too. It's universal. It's all of us. We all need the gospel, and the gospel will change us all if we'll receive it by faith. So let me start with, start with my story, and we'll go from there. I'm going to read some of this, and of course, I'll also speak from the heart. But as we say in small group, this is where our story begins. When I married Rachel, I was 19 years old. Those of you who are older, I want you to try your best to think back to your 19-year-old self. It's only been 14 years for me, and I already struggle to do it, to put myself in that mindset of being a 19-year-old. What I can remember is that at this point in my life, I felt like I had everything together, that I was on the right track, that I knew what I believed, that I was headed down the right road. In fact, I thought I had so much together that looking back now, I can see how prideful I was in the way that I thought. I saw myself as a highly gifted individual with strong character and emotional maturity. I had no idea. I wore a badge of getting married early like some kind of indicator that I was ahead of the game or ahead for my age. Of course, I was unaware of my arrogance, my ignorance, or how my opinions of myself and thoughts or emotions were impacting my life and my decision making. Now, I don't want you to get me wrong. I, want, I wanted to follow Jesus, and I had given my life to follow him, but I had a problem. I did not understand the whole gospel, so I could not experience the power of the gospel in my daily life. After a few years into our marriage, my immaturity began to surface and become more clear to my wife 
you can't live in close proximity with another person very long like that, like you do in marriage, without them learning a lot about you. In fact, I think pretty quickly she knew more about me in many ways than I knew about myself. One problem had been, that had been become very clear to me is that I was self-centered. My decisions were almost always based on my feelings and what I wanted, and I had no idea. I thought I was emotionally steady, and I was emotionally driven. My decision-making was emotionally driven. Isn't that crazy? It could be seen in simple things. I didn't volunteer to help with my kids very often when they were young. There's a picture of us on Father's Day in 2009. I didn't help around the house. I didn't change the diapers. I was selfish and very opinionated about how we spent our free time. If someone would have asked me, I would have told them that I saw myself as a selfless person. After all, I was involved in ministry and serving in the church and giving so much time. The reality was that I was unaware of my emotional problems, my weakness in my thoughts, and how these things were impacting my behaviors. Another problem that I can remember going on in my life, my 19-year-old version of myself, is that I was secretive. I was secretive. I wasn't honest and transparent about what was going on in my life and the choices I was making. When I did recognize a sin problem in my life, I typically tried to handle it on my own. I thought just me and God would be enough. I wasn't honor, honest with others about how I was feeling. In fact, I wasn't even honest with myself about how I was feeling. I frequently felt feelings of shame and guilt, but I didn't share them with anyone. When the Holy Spirit was revealing to me my problems, I ignored them or tried to handle them on my own instead of being honest with others. I did not have a clear conscience with God and others. In fact, I couldn't even imagine what that would look like. My conscience often weighed heavy on me, and I didn't know how to settle it. Well, all this pride, selfishness, lack of transparency, it led to poor decision-making and sinful behavior that hurt others. Several months ago, Rachel shared her story in connection with a message on forgiveness here in our church. Many of you heard it. When she shared that story, she revealed the hurt and pain that I had caused her by the way I had related to her and to other people. The fact is I betrayed my wife's trust and I broke her heart. I developed some feelings for another young woman. I was emotionally unaware person and I didn't know it. My emotional maturity was very low. I had myself convinced that this young woman and myself were just really good friends, but the relationship wasn't right. I had three different family members come to me and express that they, had, they felt that I had some feelings for this young woman that weren't appropriate, and that she had feelings for me that weren't appropriate. My wife was one of those three that came and expressed that to me. When they shared, I didn't agree with them. I had a problem with pride. I couldn't see it. I did not feel that I was doing anything wrong. But they were not wrong. I was the one who was wrong. As the relationship progressed, it led to actions that further betrayed my wife's trust. And those actions were things like flirting or holding hands with this other young woman or sitting close or exchanging a shoulder or back massage or spending time together. Obviously, this relationship was on a very dangerous path. My pride, selfishness, my lack of transparency, it put us on that path. Needless to say, the choices I was making had a significant impact on me and on the people I loved most. I think that's the hardest part. So that's what sin does. It pulls us away from love. And it causes us and people we care about pain. There's a song called Dear Younger Me that plays on Christian radio. It's a letter that a man is writing to his younger self. So many times I wish I could have written a letter to my younger self. 
In my pride, I could not see my faults. In my selfishness, I could not love others with the love God had shown me in Jesus. In my secrecy, I, I isolated myself in my struggle and fortified, forfeited the help I needed from my brothers in Christ. I was pretty lost and I didn't even know it. I was totally lost and I didn't even know it. Then, over seven years ago, God poured out his grace on me. He opened my eyes to see my condition. I saw my actions as sinful. I recognized the ways I was causing others pain, and it hit me all at once. I realized that I had been believing a lie. I saw that I was on a path to making even worse compromises, and I realized that I was about to burn my house down. In a moment, God showed me my condition, and I felt under heavy conviction. I felt a range of emotions, fear, conviction, peace, love, all at once. It was unlike anything I've experienced in my adult years. I can truly say that God revealed himself to me and saved me from the path of destruction that I was on. The night that Jesus showed me his grace, Rachel wasn't at the house. So I went to my computer and I wrote a letter. And in that letter, I expressed honestly all the things that God had been showing me. By God's grace, I let down my pride and I acknowledged my sins. I expressed my deep sorrow for the pain. I was just realizing that I must have been causing my wife and other people. When Rachel got home, I shared the letter with her. After reading it, the room went silent. And I'll never forget the words I heard next from her mouth. After a pause, she said, I forgive you. Those words to me are still the best picture of the gospel I've ever seen in my life. And in my eyes, my wife's a true hero of the faith. She wouldn't say any, that about herself, but I suppose that's what every true hero of the faith would do. The next day, Rachel and I visited Pastor Jerry in his office, and I shared the same letter with him. And we talked for a while, and in that letter, I offered my resignation from a staff position at the church. I was seeing things clearly in a way that I had never seen before. My own depravity had become so clear to me that I knew that I needed to be willing to let go of anything and do anything in order to be right with God and with other people. After asking Rachel and I several questions, Pastor Jerry determined that we needed to step up our discipleship together. He had heard what had transpired and that we had not expressed any kind of emotions, feelings for one another. And after hearing the details, he said, we need to step up our discipleship together. Looking back, I can understand now how Pastor Jerry, as a disciple maker, could see past my confessions in the letter and look at my spiritual condition. And what he knew then that I did not know is that I did not have faith in the gospel, at least not the whole gospel. Again, I'm going to be clear because a lot of you grew up in church. A lot of you have heard gospel messages a long time. I believed I was saved from my sins when I was six years old. And I received the gospel and started following Jesus. I had preached the gospel to others many times, and I had led other people to salvation in Jesus. The problem was not that I was not willing to have faith in the gospel, and the problem was not that I was unwilling to follow Jesus. The problem was that I did not understand the whole gospel, so I couldn't have faith in all of it. The foundation wasn't right in my life because it had a crack in it, it wasn't built on the one true gospel of the one true God. So everything I had been building on in my life was unstable. I thought I knew the gospel, but I only knew part. I had to learn the whole gospel to find freedom in Christ. So that began a discipleship journey. 
with me and Pastor Jerry. And in that journey, my life was changed because, because I came to understand the whole gospel, the one true gospel of the one true God. Jesus taught me three things that empowered me to live by faith, change my life, and overcome sin in my life. I discovered that these three things were not just for me, but these are three things every disciple of Jesus must learn and grow through in order to grow spiritually. So those are the three things that changed my life, and I want to share them with you today. First, in order for our lives to be changed by Jesus, we have to learn the whole gospel. Then we have to learn to preach the gospel to our own souls. Then we have to learn to share the gospel regularly with others. So I want to look at these three. How do we find freedom in our lives over sin? And not just over sin. Like, I resisted sin for a long time. You know, it would come, temptation, resist it, come, temptation, resist. How do we find a new life in Jesus? How do we find power to beat sin over and over and over again? What is it about our thinking and our hearts and our emotions that God can transform through the power of his spirit? And how do we get that in our lives? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to learn the whole gospel. You must learn the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just the part where Jesus went to the cross, died for your sins, and he paid for all your sins on the cross. I knew that. I had received that when I was six years old. But I had bought into a gospel that was mixed with other things, that had things in it that were true, but then had things in it that weren't part of the scriptures. There were some things about the gospel that I had picked up that were long, wrong or false, and then there were some things that I had come to believe about the gospel that just simply weren't true. A lot of those had to do with my works and what I thought would earn me a good status. And then there were other things about the gospel that I just didn't know altogether. So it was in a discipleship relationship that I discovered what is the whole gospel. I remember being transparent with Pastor Jerry after sharing all this with him and we started this new discipleship journey. And I just started sharing with him all the things that have been going on in my life. I hadn't really been transparent with that like that with anyone before, and I just started being brutally honest about the things going on in my life. And it became clear to him that I didn't understand the whole gospel. So I would come into his office, and I can remember this happening, and I would say, okay, I heard you yesterday. You were saying this and this and this about the gospel, so I think I've got it. Is the gospel like this? And then he would go, Brandon, you still don't have the gospel yet. And so it would, and after a while, like I heard that several times, it started to frustrate me a little bit because I was trying so hard to wrap my mind around the scriptures, but I was, I had a worldview that had been so deeply ingrained in me that when I read the Bible, I read something that other than what was even on the pages because I was being so heavily influenced by my own worldview and what I had come to believe. So he'd say, you don't have it yet, Brandon. And then he would point to a passage like Romans 6 through 8 or Ephesians 1 through 3 or Galatians 1 through 5. And we would go look at these passages of scripture uh, together. And then I can remember going back to my office and I would sit at my computer and I would go look up the passages he gave and then I would expand it to see the context and then I would click on uh, the link to cross-reference it, and then I would write down my thoughts, and I would try to get this straight, and then I would come back to his office, and I'd say, okay, I think I got it. Uh, is the gospel like this? And then he would say, well, you got that part right. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. Ugh. And so we'd talk some more, and then I'd end up back in my office, and this happened several times back and forth. I'm sure he was trying to sermon prep or something, um, and I would just knock on the door and come in. And it happened many days in a row because I knew something wasn't right. I knew that my whole life was being built on something that was causing instability and I needed that stability. I needed to know by faith what I was missing. I could see how sin was doing a number on me and people I loved. And so I needed to find what this is really all about. You know, there's no substitute for that in learning the gospel. You've got to learn the gospel. You have to learn it. Other people can coach you. They need, you need them to coach you, but you have to learn it. You have to be committed to learn the whole 
gospel. That's the first step. So in the course of my study, I came to believe the whole gospel. I finally learned it. I got it down. What I hadn't understood from the time I was 6 to 26 in a 20-year period, I learned in a short period because I understood my need for Jesus. I saw my depravity and my sin, and I said, I need something greater than me to beat this. And so I learned the whole gospel. That's the first thing that has to happen. You have to learn the whole gospel. And then the second builds on the first. You need to learn the gospel so well that you can preach the gospel to your own soul. Okay, the soul is the mind, the will, the emotions. That's my soul. So what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, where I'm going, what I've set my mind on, that's my soul. I have to learn to preach the gospel to my own soul because did you know that you can be led astray by your mind? That, you're, that not every thought you think is golden. Did you know that? I mean, sometimes, I, let's be honest, uh, most of us, we think, oh, I thought that thought, it must be pure gold. It's not pure gold. So many thoughts we think are influenced by the world, by the devil, by our flesh. We fall into temptations for sin. Not everything I think, not every opinion I have is pure gold. In fact, the only opinion that really truly matters is God's opinion, the opinion of Jesus. The only worldview that truly matters is the worldview of Jesus. Emotional stability can be found in Jesus. The only will that I should set myself on is the will of God and not any other will. But my soul can kind of waver. It can go like this. My spirit, oh, we're going to get to the whole gospel. Don't worry. My spirit does not. It does not waver. So what I had to learn is I had to learn that I had authority over my soul in my spirit through the power of the gospel. Do you see how that could give you some power every day? I have authority over my mind, my will, and my emotions that I don't have to be subject to whatever comes my way. That I can step into a place of authority in Christ and I can command my soul. I can take dominion over my soul. I can preach the gospel to my own soul. Don't believe me? Let's look at scripture. Look at Psalms 103, 1 through 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Who's he preaching to? His soul. He's preaching to his soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. You want to know what the benefits are? Pastor Jerry laid out the benefits last week. Like you can go, they're just listed. And I mean, they're just like a mile long. You can hear the benefits that we have in God. And then Psalm 42, 11, what about when you're discouraged? What about when your emotions aren't treating you right? Why are you cast down, oh my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall say again, praise him, my salvation and my God. Do you see how the psalmist is preaching to his own soul? In Christ, you have authority. You have dominion over your mind, your will, and your emotions. You have authority over your soul. Preaching the gospel to your own soul means confronting your thoughts, your emotions, your behavior with the truth of the gospel. Don't you understand that what you believe determines the way you live? That's why the gospel we believe determines the life we live. I believed I was doing okay. I believed I had things under control. I believed I wasn't wrong. I believed that I didn't need to share my feelings, my emotions, my struggles with anyone. I believed I had a handle on my emotion. I believed I was ahead of the game. All these beliefs about myself impacted the way I lived. When I finally came to understand the gospel, everything I had previously believed was challenged by the gospel. It was like all this stuff was in the dark and then this light came on and like, boom, you know, um, light can be a little bit painful at first whenever it's exposing things that have been hidden in darkness. I like what we heard yesterday in the men's breakfast as we were listening there, that it's painful because it shows us what's wrong in us. That's never fun. That's never comfortable. But I tell you, on the other side of that initial feeling of being confronted with what you've done wrong, 
in the gospel is total redemption and freedom. Complete grace from God and love from the Father that we do not deserve. If my thoughts and feelings disagreed with God, I reached a place through preaching the gospel to my own soul that I could engage in spiritual warfare against sin and proclaim the truth. For me, learning to preach the gospel to my own soul, it started with scripture. I already listed several passages and what I did with Pastor Jerry. That's where it began, as I learned the scripture and I learned to understand what it really meant and not just what I thought it meant. And I needed discipleship for that. I needed help for that. But then beyond learning to preach the gospel to my own soul through scripture, I learned to preach the gospel to my own soul through music. Through music. Did you know that Christian music, oh my goodness, some of it is super powerful because it has the gospel in it. And when you sing that out loud or listen to that or get together and lift your voices, you are proclaiming the gospel over your soul. You're taking dominion over your soul. You're saying, this is the truth. This is what I believe. I'm reorienting my life to this, not to all those things that can lead me astray, but to the gospel, the foundation on which my life is built. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20 is where Paul shows us the importance of preaching the gospel to our own soul through music. In Ephesians 1 through 3, it's a beautiful passage. I encourage you to go read it. Paul outlines the gospel. So you can go read it, Ephesians 1 through 3. Then in 4 through 6, the second half of the book, Paul tells us how in light of the gospel, how should we live? What should we believe and practice? Isn't that what this sermon's about, right? Here's the gospel. Here's how we should live because of that. So it's interesting that in Ephesians, one of the first practical things that Paul tells us that we should do in light of the gospel is sing. We should sing. Listen. Ephesians 5, 18 through 20, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. Give thanks, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Music was designed by God. And it is something that he designed to go past just our, just our thinking, our minds, and to touch our soul, to reach down deep into us. It's why we need to be careful with music. Because, hey, just as the truth can be communicated to our souls through music and through various art forms, lies can be communicated to our soul through music and various art forms. So as believers, we need to stand guard for what we're letting in and how much how healthy our, or, or unhealthy our diet is because of how God designed art, how God designed especially music and how it touches our soul. So I learned how to do that. When it came to preaching the gospel to my own soul through music, I've spent many hours at the piano or just singing on my own or pulling up praise and worship songs on my phone and singing along or our family singing in the car together or singing with friends or especially being here with you on Sunday morning and lifting our voices together and preaching the gospel to my own soul through music. The songs that mean the most to me are the songs that powerfully deliver gospel-centered messages. So consider these lyrics and connect them to my story that I just shared with you and connect them to your own story. Look at how powerful this is when you see it in the light of the gospel in your own story. This is all I have is Christ, Sovereign Grace Music. I once was lost in darkest night and thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see. The strength to follow your commands could never come from me. Oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever be. My only boast is you.
That's powerful. That's commanding your soul. Your soul has to respond to that because in Jesus, you have authority over it. I could go on and on with songs. I had another one written down here. You say, I'm going to pass for time. And then there's this list here. His mercy is more. We sang that this morning. The guys sang that. Ooh, powerful. Solid rock in Christ alone. The lion and the lamb. All in all, this is my destiny. The old rugged cross made the difference. Lord, I need you. We sang that this morning. Further along, living hope. We believe this is not an exhaustive list. This is a short list of many, many songs where through music we can preach the gospel to our own soul. But listen, when we, we have to learn to preach the gospel to our own soul, but we have to know the gospel first. If you don't know the whole gospel, how do you, I sang these songs, but they didn't mean to me what they mean to me now because I didn't understand the whole gospel. I read the same Bible. But it didn't mean to me then what it means to me now because I didn't understand the whole gospel. So how do we learn to walk a life free in Christ? How do we learn to live our lives, not just not doing sin, but under the glory of God? First, we learn the whole gospel. Then we learn to preach the gospel to our own souls. Then we learn to share the gospel with others regularly. This is our third point here. Learn to share the gospel with others regularly. Now, when I say share the gospel with others, if you grew up in church, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is go out and witness to lost people. You need to go out and witness to lost people, people who don't know Jesus, share the gospel with them. And I want you to know that's part of what I'm saying. But I, I have a, a theory that I believe is true, that the reason why the church is not as active in sharing the gospel with lost people as it should be is because we don't know how to even share the gospel with each other. And the reason we don't know how to share the gospel with each other is because we don't know how to share the gospel with our own soul. And the reason we don't know how to share the gospel with our own soul is because we don't know the whole gospel. Do you see how it all builds? If, you, if at any point you're lacking one of those steps, of course you're not going to be a strong witness. It's uncomfortable. You don't know. You feel uncertain. You have to know the gospel. You have to know the gospel so well you can preach it to yourself. You have to know it so well that you can preach it to yourself when your emotions are heavy, when life isn't going right, when you're discouraged. You got to know it so well that you can preach it to yourself. And as that grows, then you can share the gospel with others. So when I say share the gospel with others, I'm not just talking about evangelism. I'm talking about learning to work together as brothers and sisters in Christ to evaluate our thoughts, our emotions, our attitudes, and our behavior through the lens of the gospel. That when we share things, you know, a common question we'll ask each other in small group and discipleship is, how are you feeling? Well, when we share how you're feeling, letting that rest, but then knowing how in the right times to share the gospel in light of how we're feeling, to know how the gospel meets me right where I'm at in my emotional condition and brings me back to center on Christ. I'm talking about small group conversations where we're sharing what we're feeling and asking questions or speaking truth to the gospel or how we need to respond to the gospel. Working out our salvation is not a solo mission. I want you to look at what the scripture says, Philippians 2, 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So look at that verse. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You read that verse in English and you go, huh, I guess this is a solo mission. I guess what I'm supposed to do is kind of try to figure out the gospel on my own and just kind of work it out on my own. But there's a problem with the English language when it comes to translating Greek. Greek has a plural form of you. English does not. So when you translate this, it doesn't carry over unless you understand that the plural form of you is being used in this passage. I find it helpful as someone from Oklahoma to translate it to the Oki translation because we have a plural word for you. What is it? Y'all, all right? So let's translate this to the new Oki language. <laughs> Therefore, my beloved, as y'all 
have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out y'all's own salvation with fear and trembling. That's a better carryover for what the original Greek says. It's not a real translation, but you get the idea. Maybe we can add something here. So we've got to work out our salvation together. It's not a solo mission. How do we do that if we're never talking about the gospel? If we're never sharing what we're feeling, what we're going through, and then saying, do I have it right yet? Okay, I think it's this. Do I got it? Well, you got this part and this part, but you don't have this part. Ah, go back and study. Go back and figure out until I get the gospel. When my soul forgets, again, until I get the gospel. You know, you could ask the people in my life that I share life with the most, do we talk about the gospel? I think some of them would tell you I probably talk about the gospel too much, that we'll be going on a a walk or just doing something. And it's always, it's always just coming back to the gospel, who Jesus is, what he's done, you know, and it, it just keeps coming back up. It's changed my life. It's such a big part of my life. I can't not talk about it. I need places to share it. I gotta talk to people about the gospel to stir up my faith and to stir up their faith. So let me be clear. If you don't have friends that are talking about the gospel, it's time to get some new friends. Now, I'm not saying you have to get rid of the old ones. Maybe you're the one who needs to bring the gospel to them, or maybe they're toxic and you need to get rid of them. I'm not going to pretend to know, but you need some new friends. If you don't have friends in your life who are not just sharing their opinions and their emotions and what they think about this political thing or what they think about what's going on in our world in this way, but who are coming back to the gospel and saying, here's the truth. Now, how does this inform what we're seeing here, what we're seeing here, what we think here, what we feel here? How is the gospel going to inform all those things? And if you don't have that in your life, it's time to get it. You need friends who will share with you the gospel Preaching the gospel to others becomes natural when we learn to preach the gospel to our own soul, and that becomes natural when we learn the whole gospel and we come to faith in it. We really believe it. We accept it as true. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said about the gospel once again in the book of Romans in the first chapter before he preaches the whole gospel. He does this over and over. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Hear him? I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to those who believe. From faith to faith, because the righteous will live by faith. We have to learn to come to faith in the gospel. To do that, we have to learn the whole gospel. For me, I was full of pride. I was selfish, I was emotional, and unaware of my emotions. I had secrets, and I wasn't sharing my secrets with anyone. Why? Because I was being controlled by something other than the gospel. Not because I didn't have power. But Galatians 5.1 says, for freedom, you've been set free. So don't return to a yoke of bondage. Well, if you don't know the gospel and the authority and the power you have in it, you just turn, return right to that yoke of bondage. I, I think about it like this. I think about, do an impromptu prop here. I think about before I knew Jesus, sin and Satan ruled over my life is what the scripture says. It ruled over me. But in Christ, he's been placed under my feet. I have dominion over sin, over death, over Satan. And then what we do as believers when we don't understand the gospel or have faith in it, or when we let other things besides the gospel compel us to do something, is we go, how do we get back under here? How do we get back under this? Instead of ruling over the gospel, I mean, over sin and death through the gospel. I wasn't there. I was being ruled by something else. But through learning the gospel and faith in the gospel, Jesus set me free. And I'll say it again. What he did for me through the gospel, he will do for you if you'll believe it. So if I've I've connected with you at all this morning, there should be one last question we need to answer. 
and then we can be done. But this question is where it all starts. What is the one true gospel of the one true God? What is the whole gospel that we must believe? Now, I want you to know, I prefer to share this with people in a discipleship relationship. I love to sit across the table and look them in the eye as I'm sharing the gospel and, and watch and see when they're getting it and then when it's not making sense and then them asking me a question and then me following up. And I think that's how this works best. So I hope that this message more than anything will stir you up to do it. If you know the gospel, you got to start talking to other people about it because they don't know it. They think they know it, they don't know it. And then if you don't know the gospel, you got to start talking to other people about it so you can learn it. And so I hope, if anything, this moves you in that direction. But I feel like I, I would miss an opportunity if I didn't do my best in this setting to present to you the one true gospel of the one true God and to give you a chance to come to faith in that gospel. I tell people all the time, your heart can get in front of your head and that's okay. If you hear the gospel this morning and your heart is moved to faith in that gospel and you believe, you can believe right now. If you've already believed, you can believe the whole gospel and it'll change your life beginning now. If you've never believed, you can believe the whole gospel and Jesus will save you right now. And then your head can catch up later on if your heart is there and if you're willing to believe. But we gotta catch our heads up. That was a big problem for me. We gotta catch our heads up into this. Faith in the one true gospel of the one true God. So here we go. What is the one true gospel of the one true God. I don't know if I'll even make it through it. I'm already going. In the beginning, there was God. And he is perfect in all of his ways. There's none righteous but him. He alone is good, and he is the very embodiment, personif personification of the word supreme. He rules and reigns over all. He is complete in himself, lacking nothing. He doesn't need anything. He is self-sufficient. He is in control of all things. And at the same time, with all that power, he is wonderfully and completely good. There is nothing wrong with God. And in his goodness and his love and for his glory, he made people. And he made them to be right with him in a one relationship with God. And when he made those first people, he made them to rule over his creation. And he put in them the divine imprint of himself so that we are all image bearers of God. And God had a relationship with them that was unlike any other. He walked with them in the cool of the garden. They knew his voice. He knew their voice. And they were one together. And in that garden, God placed a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it stood as a memorial, a statute to the goodness of God, that he was unlike his creation. That man, though made in the image of God, was still dependent on God for all that he had and everything he needed. And he told the man and the woman not to eat of any, that they could eat of any fruit in the garden except the one, that tree of the knowledge, good and evil. And it stood there as that reminder that God is not like us. He is different than us. But that ancient serpent, the devil, he's cunning. He came in and he told them lies. He got them to believe some other worldview than the one worldview that was right. He told them lies about themselves. He told them lies about God. And through those lies, he led them, manipulated them to sin. And the scripture says, oh, that sin brings death. God had told them, if you eat from that tree, you will surely die. And they took and they ate of that tree and sin entered the world and it separated man from God. You know what death is? Death is an unnatural separation between two things that should have never been separated. When we die, our spirit, our soul leaves our body. That's unnatural. God never intended that things work that way, and that's death. 
Well, God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. But their, their brainwaves didn't stop firing. Their heart didn't stop beating. Did God lie? No, the scripture describes a different kind of death that they experienced that would be worse than physical death. It was a spiritual death of the separation of their spirit from the spirit of God. Not because God changed. He was still entirely good and right and just in all of his ways and loving and merciful and full of grace. Nothing about him changed, but we changed. People changed. They left God and were separated from God because of sin. And rather than exercise judgment on those people and destroy them in their sin immediately, God had a different plan in mind. A plan that he had agreed with the son from before the foundations of the world, that he would launch a rescue plan to save mankind from his and her sin. To rescue them from their depravity because he loved them. And he wanted that relationship with them. And what we discovered through reading the Old Testament is that no matter how hard people tried, we could not be in right relationship with God. We just keep falling into sin. And if you study the pattern of your life, you'll find the same thing to be true about yourself. That apart from God, we just keep cycling in our sin. And we experience that separation from God and God made us to be eternal beings. So when our spirit gets separated from God, it's not just in this life, but it's forever because we're eternal. And the Bible describes a second death. The second death is called the lake of fire or hell. And the Bible says, we will all stand in judgment and books will be opened that contain the record of our lives. And we will be judged by what is written in those books. And if anyone is not found perfect and righteous and holy, they will be separated from God forever because death, through sin, uh, death came through sin and separated us from God. And because we're eternal, that separation will last forever. And there is, the Bible says that there is absolutely nothing that we can do in our strength, through our merits, to make ourselves right with God once again. That we are born into sin of the race of Adam and we are sinners by nature, sinners by choice, and that all of us stand condemned before a holy God who is loving and powerful and good. But God did not want us to remain in this condition. So he did something since we couldn't do it. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, and he bore in himself sin. You see, the scripture says that he was born of the Virgin Mary and conceived of the Spirit of God, meaning he wasn't born into sin, uh, into the flesh like we were. The Bible calls him a second Adam. The first Adam still messed up. The Bible calls him a second Adam, a new opportunity, a hope for humanity. And he was born, and unlike the first Adam, he lived a perfect life. He was tempted by Satan himself just like the first Adam was, but yet was found without sin. He and the Father were one. They were right together. But the scripture says that some evil men condemned him and took him to a cross and killed him. But really, the scripture reveals that he went to the cross on his own volition, under his own free will, so that he could bear on himself the wrath of God that we deserve for our sins. And the scripture says it this way, he, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. And they put his hands on that cross and nailed him there. And his feet, and they nailed him there. And he hung, he suffered, until the full wrath of God was poured out on him, until finally it was enough. And it was more than any of us could bear. And on that cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, he experienced death, not just physically, but spiritually. The father and the son were never supposed to be separated. But Jesus took on his soul all of our sins. Every one of them. And he died separated from the father. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God in him. 
The scripture says that by his wounds I've been healed. That my great sin debt that I could never atone for has been atoned for in Christ. He took my sin to the grave and I bear it no more. Now that's the first part of the gospel and that's the gospel I believed and learned when I was six years old. But guys, the gospel doesn't stop there. I got it wrong. I thought it did. It doesn't stop there. I like what David Platt says about it. He says, that part of the gospel is incredible and should not be underestimated because it made us not wrong with God. Our sin divided us from God and we were no longer wrong with him. But it's the resurrection of Jesus and the sending of his spirit that makes us right with God. Children of God. Because he didn't stay in the grave. Three days later, he rose from the grave, proving that he had power over sin and death. He ascended into heaven, and 40 days later, he sent his Holy Spirit. And when his Spirit came, the Bible says that among those who had faith in him, that his Spirit was united with them so that they were one in Christ. And the old man who they used to be was executed, crucified. It is no more. I'll never forget when Pastor Jerry told me that Galatians 2.20 was literal. You have been crucified with Christ. Oh, I had the gospel wrong. I thought that was some kind of figure of speech. You have been crucified with Christ. Your old man is dead. And it's not you who live anymore, but if you've come to faith in Jesus, it's now Christ who lives in you. Jesus talked about it in John 3 when he said, you got to be born of the Spirit. Paul talked about it in 1 Corinthians 5 when he said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old man has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You become a new thing. You are no longer what you used to be. Yeah, I look the same. My body's still the same, but who I am is different. I died and a new life in Christ was raised up in me and I have all kinds of new authority and dominion in that place, in that new spiritual man. One of them a right to boldly approach the throne of God, to know his heart, to spend time with him and to be transformed by his truth, to agree with God and not with my flesh, to agree with God and not with Satan, to agree with God and not the world. I have authority over all of those thoughts and I can bring everything into subjection under the gospel and I can command my own soul because of who I am in Christ. And I will live forever. This body will die, but I'll get a new one. And when I die and I go to be with the Father, I'll get a new body and I will live with him forever in his eternal kingdom where he will be my God, we will be his people and we'll forever be with the Lord. And if you'll examine every decision, emotion, thought, behavior in your life, through the lens of the truth of that worldview and that gospel. And if you'll build it out so you understand it, you'll have power that you've never understood before. That's the one true gospel of the one true God. So this is how we get to close this morning. We're going to declare it through a song together and sing it. But before we do, I just want to invite you to stand and join me in prayer. I wonder if there's anyone in this room right now who's never believed the one true gospel of the one true God, or if there's anyone in this room right now who has not understood it, and hey, I'm not going to pretend like you just got it all. I went back and forth from Pastor Jerry's office so many times. You could go online and listen to that presentation a few times at the end, and, but, but even then, you need someone else to coach you through it, to help you understand it. But I wonder if right now, if even if your head's not 100% there, if your heart's there. So would you bow with me in prayer just for a moment and just ask the Lord right now, do I have faith in this gospel? Have I believed the gospel, the whole gospel? Because the gospel we believe determines the lives we live. And the gospel we preach determines the disciples we will make. Do you believe the whole gospel? I wonder if right now in this room, if there's anyone who needs to say, I need to receive the whole gospel for the first time. If that's you, then would you just respond right now to what the Lord's putting in your heart by just raising your hand and saying, that's me. I need to receive the gospel for the first time. Amen. I see that. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I need to receive the whole gospel 
the one true gospel of the one true God. And then I wonder right now if there's anyone in this room who needs to say, I've not been living in victory in my life. I've been being controlled by something other than the gospel. My faith has been in something else besides the one true gospel of the one true God. I wonder if there's anyone in this room right now who needs to say, today, right now, I'm repenting of all other worldviews, of all other opinions, of all the feelings that I have and all the flesh that leads me to whatever it is that's gonna destroy me. And I receive the one true gospel by faith today again. Would you raise your hand if that's you? It's just saying, I'm gonna repent and walk in that. Amen. So many hands. We gotta fight for the gospel every day. It's not, I finally understood it. It's not just, it's not just, I received the gospel when I'm six and I'm good. I need the gospel every single day to walk in freedom and to be the new man. Well, there's something we can do powerfully to proclaim it, and this is how we close. We sing it together. We sing it together. We lift up our voices, and we don't just say words on a screen, but we connect those words to our life. And we express in those words and with our hearts our appreciation to God and our faith in Him. And we, through singing, preach it to each other. Each one of us proclaiming the gospel to one another. A habit that should begin right now but go throughout the whole week as we walk in faith in the gospel. Let's sing this and then we'll be dismissed.